All right. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to wish you happy Diwali to all those who follow or all those who know about it. Let there be light in your life. Today's speaker is going to be Dr. Krishna, fondly known as Murali. He needs no introduction at all to the EPR community, but it's my duty and indeed an honor to do so. As a matter of fact, uh, I have had the privilege of continuously working with Murali in the EPR field for over 42 years, and it is still going very well. Murali obtained his PhD in physics in 1984 from the Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai, India, where he was. I was also doing a PhD in chemistry at that time. He then joined the National Cancer Institute as a visiting fellow in 1984. And since 1993, he has been a principal, principal investigator and chief of the biophysical spectroscopy section of the radiation biology branch of the National Cancer Institute. In 2006, he was inducted into the senior biomedical research service at NIH, which is, which is, which is a very, very uh, major recognition of his activity, his work, research work, his activities and accomplishments are directly related to the fields of radiation biology and radiation oncology, cancer biology and radiation oncology. He has published over uh, 300 research articles in high impact, high profile journals. Among the many honors and scientific recognitions awarded to Murali are the several Federal Technology Transfer Awards and an invitational visiting professorship to Japan to the, in, on behalf of the Japan Society for Promotion of Science. Murali has been a member of the editorial board of Magnetic Resonance for a long time from I think, uh, I guess 2005. And currently he is also an editorial member of the AACR Journal Cancer Research. For you may not know, Murali is a member of the interagency group part of National Security Agency for allocation of helium-3 isotope for MRI. He has been championing the allotment of helium-3 for medical imaging. Also, he is the key member in the National Cancer Institute Clinical Metabolic MRI Program. Murali is a major leader in EPR instrumentation development, testing, and biological applications of novel, non-invasive, molecular, and functional imaging modalities for potential clinical applications. His research has focused on two areas of molecular imaging, the measurement of tumor and normal tissue oxygen concentration and hyperpolarized C13 pyruvate metabolic imaging. Importantly, his preclinical research is expanding our knowledge of the tumor microenvironment with respect to tumor hypoxia and its clinical implications. Above all, Murali has a latitude of superb scientific judgment and balanced wisdom to make significant contributions to the clinical and translational imaging in cancer. In 2014, he was awarded the International EPR Society Silver Medal in Biology and Medicine in recognition of his outstanding contribution and dedication to advancing the biomedical applications of EPR technology and excellence in scientific research. Without further ado, I now invite Murali to present his lecture. And all other participants during this time, please mute your microphone and you can open it up when you have, when you ask questions at the end of the lecture. Once again, thank you Coops for the kind introduction and also taking some time from my own talk. Uh, you <laughs> went over the limit, but Happy Diwali to you all, uh, and Murugnani, uh, uh, thanks for including uh, me to represent the work uh, we have done at NIH. So the title of the talk is Metabolic and Physiological Imaging Biomarkers uh, in Tumors to Guide Treatment. So what is going? How do I go to the next slide? You are in control. Your, your keyboard. Okay. Okay. So this is a cartoon 
from Scientific American, uh, Rakesh Jain published close to 20 years ago to demonstrate the vascular network in normal uh, uh, tissue uh, shown here. Uh, you see the mouse? Uh, no, move, move, move it. Yeah, move, now move. I, yep, yep. Okay, okay good. So uh, Rakesh Jain has uh, published uh, after extensive work a cartoon of the vascular network in normal tissue where it's everything is well regulated, uh, almost like a network of, with certain symmetry because the balance of anti-angiogenic and pro-angiogenic factors are in tight control. These vessels are well organized, uh, robust in uh, their integrity and they supply oxygen and nutrients. And tumor, because of the high growth demand, the pro-angiogenic factors uh, are, are dominate. And then we end up with this resultant chaotic uh, vascular network, which uh, uh, results in a poor perfusion, poor oxygenation, poor delivery of everything. So these uh, uh, features make uh, uh, this, I think, is again a, a, a histology to show a normal tissue, uh, a normal tissue in colon, colon carcinoma, and in the skin and the melanoma and skeletal muscle and sarcoma, you have seen very ordered vascular network uh, in the normal tissue, whereas in cancer, it's very disorganized. So that is one thing to remember. Uh, why am I, I think... Uh, okay. So another uh, aspect to remember in, uh, uh, in tumors is that uh, in normal tissue, in differentiated tissue, in the presence of oxygen, glucose is utilized to generate energy equivalents uh, through oxidative phosphorylation. And only when there's absence of oxygen in normal tissue, you use glucose to build up lactate. This is anaerobic glycolysis. This is oxidative phosphorylation. But in tumor, uh, even when you have oxygen, majority of uh, glucose is consumed through this pathway called aerobic glycolysis and degenerating lactate. So, I'm having trouble moving slides. You may, you may use, use keyboard for advancing. Okay, good. So uh, as a result, uh, tumors have less oxygen and because of uh, the aerobic glycolysis, you have high lactate, so you have low pH. And that is the reason why tumors are considered to have hostile microenvironment. So assessment of oxygen in tumors uh, done in the past uh, by the Duke group, uh, uh, where they have used uh, this electrode, oxygen sensing electrode and the stepper motor, they drive along few uh, uh, directions and create a histogram. You can see that in normal tissue, while the median is about 50 millimeter mercury, in tumors, the median is 11 point, about 12 millimeter mercury, most readings below 10. So a failure of radiation therapy is uh, because of, these uh, readings in tumors, uh, at, uh, that, is, that is the reason these uh, regions are not uh, killed by radiation at the dose which is uh, normally prescribed, not considering uh, the hypoxic uh, region. So as a result, tumors classified based on the oxygen, you can see survival when tumor oxygenation level, median PO2 is better than 10 millimeter mercury, uh, the survival is longer than that when the PO2 is less than 10 millimeter mercury. So, so molecular imaging is uh, the place where we have to find methods which can report in tumor hypoxia. There are many which exist currently, MRI-based and PET-based, and uh, this being the EPR group, uh, I will talk about EPR. But uh, Use of molecular imaging in cancer research is uh, 
CT and MRI, if you look at uh, uh, the use of these techniques to see treatment response, any volumetric change in tumor in response to treatment takes out weeks. Metabolic and physiological changes manifest early in the treatment phase and um, imaging techniques which can perceive these will be useful, especially in uh, the treatment with the checkpoint inhibitors, even when there's treatment uh, response, uh, the anatomic images show pseudo progressions. How do you distinguish uh, treatment response to progression? So molecular imaging techniques uh, play a very important role. So uh, I think I went into a wrong, uh, can I just see if I'm using the right file? Can you give me like one minute? Yeah, I was using the wrong. <laughs> okay. Now, can you see my, my slide? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Sorry about I was using a completely <laughs> different uh, slide. Uh, so uh, we have gone through this. So, so tumor hypoxia, I just went through this. So molecular imaging techniques to profile the tumor microenvironment. Uh, what I have in my lab uh, for preclinical research are EPR imaging for PO2, MRI using uh, 13C labeled substrates such as pyruvate, alpha ketoglutarate, and things like that. I also have a PET uh, imaging for small molecules. And uh, in our department, I am involved with the clinical C13 studies and also PET studies. So when MRI came to the clinical uh, realm in early 80s, EPR community, uh, I think that I took this or uh, something like that from Dr. Eaton's uh, CRC volume. Uh, when the MRI came to the clinical realm and uh, EPR uh, was as uh, many people asked the question, what is the capability of EPR? So in MRI, spin systems are protons, now carbon concentration is high and the probe is very stable. Whereas EPR imaging, uh, endogenously what we have are free radicals and those are, uh, uh, fortunately for us, uh, very low and they're very short-lived. So there are no endogenous spin probes for EPR. We need exogenous free radicals with simple EPR spectra for in vivo EPR. So the question asked at that time was, uh, what is the uh, possibility of using EPR for clinic? Well, there are only two problems. There's nothing to image and uh, Spin dynamics, spin physics of electrons are so much faster than protons. Uh, we don't have any digital electronics for transient recording of the echo. So there was this consensus that is there's nothing to image and there's no way to image. So if we have something to inject, how do we make use of it uh, for in vivo studies? We can make measurements of oxygen in tissues with EPR because molecular oxygen has two unpaired electrons and they can impose a T2 contrast on a paramagnetic tracer if available and broaden the line or shorten its echo time. And if we can quantify that, uh, uh, we can map oxygen, the PO2 in a, uh, a, qu in a quantitative manner. So, yeah, so, I want to show a typical time domain experiment to show why we thought at that time there it's EPR imaging is challenging. If you look at a typical uh, time domain magnetic resonance experiment, uh, you can see you put the spin probe, let's say for two, two in two tubes in a magnetic field, you have in, in the case of NMR, MRI, you have an FID which lasts for a few seconds, and you have a spectrum whose line width are in hertz. In EPR, you have a spin system under ideal conditions of two microseconds, around two to five microseconds. 
and its line widths are in the range of hundreds of kilohertz. That is as far as the experiment goes. The challenge is, I should say, I shouldn't put number here, but a significant portion of the signal in EPR, in a time domain experiment, is lost uh, in the dead time here. For if an, in an exponentially decaying signal, you lose a big portion of the initial part where the signals are intense, whereas an MRI or NMR, you don't lose much in the signal. So you have a very narrow signal there. And uh, in EPR, you have a very broad signal and you lose most of it in the, by the time you apply the pulse and for the receiver to recover from the pulse, even though you have the best possible isolation, it takes several hundreds of nanoseconds. And if uh, you have a signal is lasting between one to five microseconds, you have lost about the first part. So that is one big diff difficulty there. Then imaging, in imaging, uh, uh, you can apply a pulse, wait, and then switch on a gradient and wait, and then switch on the frequency uh, encoding gradient, and then you can collect an echo and you have beautiful images. Whereas in EPR, initially all of us started projection reconstruction. So what you do is, uh, oops, uh, what you do is uh, you apply a pulse while the gradients are already applied, and then you collect the signal, and then you rotate the gradient and you collect, collect various projections, and then you have an image. But the main problem is because the line widths in hundreds of kilohertz, uh, the resolution is uh, very poor. So although initially we thought uh, we had a good um, spin system, but once we were using projection reconstruction, at least in our hands, we couldn't, uh, uh, make images with good resolution. So we were kind of very desperate at that time what to do because if you have a two and a half uh, centimeter bore resonator and if your resolution is one and a half centimeter, it's not going to uh, help very much. And when you are desperate, you read literature of any kind. So at that time we were looking at how concrete thaws in Nova Scotia. And uh, so this was a study pioneered by Bruce Balcom. And what he introduced to the field is instead of collecting the whole echo and then doing a Fourier transform and get uh, a signal uh, and it's very uh, large line width so in the frequency encoding, what Bruce Balcom does is that uh, he monitors one single time point in the FID and monitor its phase variation with gradients. Uh, so you can use phase encode using this method and populate your case space where, based on the phase modulation. So you have removed any contribution of frequency in your image resolution. Thereby, you have imaging capabilities, which, uh, for example, we have uh, used a phantom prescribed by uh, uh, some uh, experts of for resolution. We filled this phantom with various uh, blank spots and uh, ridges and things like that. And then MRI, we have a resolution of a 0.125 millimeter at seven Tesla. And uh, here we have a DPR 0.4 millimeter uh, square in plane. So this was quite uh, uh, encouraging for us to uh, uh, do this. Uh, 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 but then comes, uh, the availability of a tracer. What are the possible tracers? Initially, we thought nitroxides are very good, but uh, experience from many labs show that their pharmacokinetics, uh, the, lie, the nitroxides decay very fast because they enter intracellular spaces and metabolize inside the cells. And the line widths are half a gauss uh, or more, so your resolution is not going to be good. So. Then comes uh, uh, this candidate, the triphenyl methyl radical. It was originally synthesized and uh, its electronic state characterized by a chemist from University of Michigan, Moses Gomberg. Uh, this is the triphenyl methyl radical or the triple radical. Interesting uh, read of this paper. The last few lines is research in this field will continue and I reserve this uh, field for myself. And uh, Fraser's colleagues in GE, they did not read this paper. So they went and modified the molecule and fortunate for the EPR community. 
they came out with a very good spin probe whose toxicology profile, pharmacology profile, spectral profile, half-life, make various things make it ideal for EPR imaging. So its line width, as you all would know, uh, is linearly dependent on oxygen concentration. Its pharmacologic half-life is uh, larger than 20 minutes. It's going to be in extravascular, extracellular space, so it uh, gives you tissue oxygenation, but cannot give you intracellular PO2, but tissue oxygen uh, assessment capabilities are good enough. So we use this, and uh, this is the first in vivo uh, imaging of a triple radical uh, published uh, with the work done by my colleague at that time, Ram Murugesan. And uh, this was what Howard Halpern would call uh, uh, deut uh, Finland, deuterated Finland radical. And we had such small quantity. And uh, at that time, our power amplifiers were also not able to excite larger uh, objects. So we wound a coil around the mouse tail, and it has two uh, pairs of uh, arteries, and we can see the distribution of the spin probe. So this is as far as spatial imaging in vivo of a tritial radical. This is the first report. And then we applied the single point imaging uh, later on, a few years later, where we uh, excite the spin system under gradients. And after the dead time, we collect one time point and monitor its uh, phase. And we have something equivalent to a gradient recall, the co experiment and MRI. We have a projection. So we first did a phantom uh, with two tubes which span the uh, uh, resonator well. And uh, this is by SPI, single point imaging. This is by projection reconstruction. A very good correspondence of uh, the object in terms of the image. And then we also did uh, image a mouse uh, with a bigger coil, which we used here. And we can see contours of the kidney and the spins also in the cortex and medulla and bladder. So this is the uh, experience we had with this. But then we had to improve upon the uh, temporal resolution. Here, uh, my colleague at that time, Kenichiro Matsumoto, he has made a nice demonstration of, uh, uh, of a single point imaging and how do you collect an echo. And other figures in this paper show how do you uh, do a T2 weighting because if we only take one time point and it's only phase encoding, we lose the oxygen dependent uh, T2. And here he shows nicely, how do you do that? And then he got nice images of a uh, mouse with a tumor, different, uh, here's the bladder, but different oxygen levels. But those days the experiment, uh, the 3D imaging would take us about 10, 12 minutes. So we had to improve upon the temporal resolution. And my colleague Deva, who kind of came up with the faster way of gradient settling down, and uh, we have improved the imaging from 10, a few, uh, 15 minutes to 20 minutes to eight minutes for a 3D meeting. And then we uh, did various other case space uh, learning from the MRI field, uh, partial case space, case space regrading, sparse sampling, phase and frequency encoding, so various things. And also following the work from Howard Halpern's group, even T2-weighted maps, uh, where we can, just like DCE MRI, we did this study, so we were able to get good correspondence with oxygen and the, and the test tubes. Here, this is one thing I just want to show you, and I'll go a little bit more detail, is if people are using particulates like uh, lithium thalocyanin or such uh, oxygen-responding paramagnetic spin probes, we were able to uh, use a surface coil to detect. But right underneath, if you put a pump coil and then uh, pump it with this frequency, 600 megahertz, and then they put a wireless coil, just a loop around, around, along with the sample, we have about 15-fold enhancement, 15-fold is quite high enhancement and signals noise. So this is just as a 
And then we tried making some multiple element coils. One other thing we did was uh, using oscillatory gradients, we have also demonstrated uh, that it's possible to select a slice and then we can do a single point imaging in that slice. We didn't pursue that further. But uh, most important following the work from Denver, uh, we were able to show that uh, we can get the same image uh, using a single pulse 200 watt versus uh, Frank or Hadamard, which is an almost noise level excitation. So this is what is needed uh, if we plan to go for humans where the RF deposition uh, uh, limits set by the regulatory we have to overcome. So these are strategies we have to follow. So co-registration, we tried the first study where we had, this is our system. Uh, it works at uh, 300 megahertz, 10 millitesla. And we put it in a shielded box and then we have a tumor bearing mouse. This is the tumor, this is the normal tissue. And these are two tubes containing the frital radical. Then we take the whole system, put it in a farmer and go to seven Tesla. And then we collect uh, uh, an anatomic image along with the two fiducials we have put. And then we have an anatomically co-registered uh, map of PO2. And uh, we published uh, this in 2008, but uh, later on we found that uh, we don't need to use the same coil, we use the same farmer. So we have adjacent to the EPR a one Tesla Brooker permanent magnet, so we can use that as well. So we don't have to just uh, use the same coil. So with that, we saw that uh, here is an anatomic image, T2 weighted, and here is the PO2 image of a tumor bearing mouse. This is the tumor and that's the oxygen level. We change the breathing gas to carbogen and we see we have oxygenated tumor. So we, this is useful for dynamic challenges of any kind. And then after this, we use uh, iron oxide nanoparticles to, which are blood pool agents, or T2 agents, and we can see difference between before and after the iron oxide, we have a nice description of uh, the blood vessel density. Mm -hmm. Then, we can take a 3D image and slice through the tumor in the computer. You can see the oxygen distribution. And uh, at that time, using all these strategies, we were able to collect images in three minutes, spatial resolution being two millimeter cube and PO2 plus minus two millimeter mercury. So you can also look at um, uh, changes in PO2. Uh, so here we did a PO2 map uh, in a tumor bearing mouse and a tracer level map. And here is the tracer level and the PO2 level in four regions we selected. If you see there, all these different regions uh, accumulate triple radicals at a certain level, but they don't change. But if you look at region one, it changes from almost normoxia to zero, and uh, this is what uh, Mark Duhers has been very helpful throughout my research last uh, many decades. I uh, said this is cy cycling up hypoxia, which is an important uh, observation by imaging. And he, this is chronic hypoxia, and these are different levels of cycling hypoxia. So we were able to quant you know, quantify fluctuations in oxygen by EPR. I think. Uh, this is where compared to PET imaging uh, for oxygen, uh, EPR has an edge. And uh, then we also used uh, different tumors and see what is the correspondence between EPR-based oxygenation, uh, aerobic glycolysis using C30 labeled hyperpolarized tracers and uh, fluorodeoxyglucose. So this tells you about uh, monocarboxylate uh, transporter and uh, LDHA activity. This takes about uh, glucose uptake and hexokinase activity. And this is based on EPR imaging. And if you see, this is the hypoxic uh, fraction 10 uh, from EPR, and this is uh, flow FDG uptake uh, in the tumors, various three different tumor lines. And this is lactate to pyruvate ratio. We have a good orthogonality uh, between oxygenation and uh, glycolysis. So this is the first study trying to see with various uh, techniques, 
how the uh, the three techniques match up. Then we started applying uh, EPR imaging to various drugs and drug responses. And uh, Rakesh Jain uh, introduced a concept called normalizing the tumor vasculature for better uh, drug delivery. So he said that if you use anti-angiogenic drugs, those drugs kind of uh, uh, destroy immature vessels and the residual normal vessels function better. And that was the reason uh, they respond better to chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And they were uh, what they call a clinical studies he has done. So we set up, uh, of course, we consulted him. We set up a study where the, uh, our, uh, when the tumors are injected on day 10, before treatment with sinutinib, or two days or four days after treatment, you can see the tumor has significantly oxygenated, whereas using the iron oxide particles, the blood vessels have been pruned. And if you look at uh, oxygen, the histograms have shifted to the right uh, for on treatment with the sunitinib compared to before. And the iron oxide particle read shows that the blood vessel density histogram has shifted to the left, consistent with the observations made by uh, Rakesh Jain that uh, anti-angiogenic drugs prune immature vessels and the residual vessels function better. And uh, yeah, this is the... Uh, another application, wireless implantable coil with amplification. So what we do is uh, normally if we have a surface coil and we have a particulate spin system at a certain distance, you get a signal like this. But if we put a pumping coil and a wireless coil right next to the spin probe, and then we, without pumping, uh, the pump coil, uh, versus pumping, you see you have a significant uh, enhancement of uh, uh, the signal. So this is uh, implanted in a mouse, uh, day zero, day five, day 12. We can chronically see that uh, uh, without any disturbance, and we can measure the line width uh, if the probe be implanted is a uh, uh, oxygen responding uh, in terms of. So, now that we have a, an imaging system, we have a spin probe, we have methods to get a reasonable resolution in terms of spectral, spatial, and temporal. What do we do with that? Uh, so, so here I want to show the value of a priori PO2 assessment. And these are two drugs I want to show, evophosphamide and PEG-PH20, both have gone through preclinical to clinical phase one, phase two, phase three. They have failed at phase three. My feeling is had there been a, a PO2 imaging system available to humans, it would have been possible to select the appropriate uh, patients for treatment with this because these two almost would have made it to clinic, would have made it to clinic had there been an imaging uh, component introduced. So what I'll uh, present some data with more detail than the examples I showed you before. I'll first talk about evophosphamide, it's called TH302. So the question we asked is, can imaging predict treatment response with radiation? Can a priori tumor hypoxia information guide treatment choice? So what we did was uh, pulse TPR imaging and metabolic MRI using uh, hyperpolarized uh, car pyruvate with the 13C labeled at the one position. And the treatments were radiation and TH3O2, it's also called evophosphamide. Before that, we took, grew the tumors and looked at all the markers, which tell you about some microenvironmental details. Uh, uh, this is CD31, tells you about the microvessel density, pulmonidazole, hypoxia, and LDHA activities, so aerobic glycolysis. Uh, so you can see that uh, HS766 has highest glycolytic activity compared to SU866. And uh, HS766 has the highest uh, PMO staining and uh, they are compared to SU866. And uh, HS766 uh, has a lower microvessel density readout as by CD31. So then we go to, I want to tell you a little bit about this drug. Uh, so this is evophosphamide. It contains a nitroheterocycle, which is same as uh, 
Mysonide is all used in um, uh, PET for oxygen uh, imaging. Uh, so this is the kind of a sensor of oxygen. And this is the chemotoxin. So when in normoxia, uh, enzymatic systems, cytochromes, P450 oxidoreductases, they put an electron on this part of the molecule. When there's oxygen, uh, oxygen takes it back uh, to the or original state at uh, chemical uh, reaction rates, diffusion limited, that is 10 to the nine per mole per second. When there's no oxygen, and then this, uh, this uh, undergoes fragmentation, un unimolecular fragmentation, and then it releases the mustard, ni the nitrogen mustard, which goes on and uh, uh, causes DNA damage by alkylation and ultimately cell death. So in vitro, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mitchell, Jim Mitchell has shown that uh, at a one log survival, when there's no oxygen, it's about uh, 50 to 60 nanomolar compared to fully oxygenated conditions as 100 micromolar. So that's a huge therapeutic window that is you need so little of it uh, because this pathway is blocked and uh, it's going further. So then we did the three, sorry for the anatomic image, but that's not important, but we have HS766, which we showed that it is highly glycolytic and staining with PMO very high compared to this. And we see that this, tu this tumor, uh, HS766, has more than 50% hypoxic region, that is less than 10 millimeter mercury compared to this is like only 25% uh, of the volume of the tumor is hypoxic. So then we do a treatment response uh, uh, with uh, uh, this drug TH302. So you can see that uh, HS766, uh, which is the most hypoxic tumor, uh, this is the control arm, this is the drug arm, this is radiation. That is the uh, hypoxic cytotoxin works very effectively in uh, HS766, which is a hypoxic tumor. And uh, SU8686, the TH302 has almost no effect. Whereas radiation, as is expected in well oxygenated tumors, radiation responds well. And this is also a very hypoxic tumor, and you can see that uh, radiation works better. So here, PO2 imaging can predict treatment response with radiation and hypoxic uh, drugs. So this drug would have fared better if they had even used any surrogate of PO2, such as DCE, MR, or any other technique available, because it failed at uh, phase three of uh, 5,000 patients. And uh, But uh, in Japan, they're still, I think, uh, salvaging this drug for uh, use. So we also saw the correspondence of PO2 uh, and uh, the glycolysis done by C13 MRI. So, can C13 until an EPR modality comes to the clinic, uh, can C13 do this job is the question we have. I think EPR uh, in terms of economics, uh, it's going to be a cheaper technique than hyperpolarized C13. My feeling is that method may be mostly in academic centers, but will not be in a community hospital. So. That is one thing. And the next drug uh, I wanted to show is uh, something which uh, works differently in the tumor microenvironment. It is well known that solid tumors have high levels of extra stromal content, making drug delivery and oxygen delivery limited. Uh, and this is especially common in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So this is a, an article which uh, uh, we wrote, uh, Dr. Duhers wrote, and we contributed some. And it's a nice figure he has that uh, if there's a high stromal density, the vessels collapse because of interstitial fluid pressure. But in tumors which have less interstitial fluid pressure, the vessel is not uh, uh, collapsed. And you see in high stromal content tumors, uh, you have regions of hypoxia, but um, in normal uh, fluid pressure in tumors uh, not elevated, you have well-perfused regions. So oxygen is supplied and drugs are supplied. So here is another 
cartoon of the same uh, by this company called Halozyme, which took uh, uh, a drug uh, uh, called uh, uh, hyaluronidase, which kind of uh, destroys the stroma in the tumor. So the yellow region are stromal deposits, mostly hyaluronin, and these are fibroblasts, and this is the tumor cell, and these are the vessels. So if you use uh, a, a drug which degrades the stroma, then what happens is that once the stroma is really, really, um, removed, then you have better perfusion of the tumor, and uh, then you have all the benefits of uh, improved drug delivery or improved uh, radiation response. Here is their preclinical study by the company where uh, this is the interstitial fluid pressure. This is something Mark Duhers pioneered for many years, uh, showing that it's an important uh, feature of the tumors to study. Uh, so this is the interstitial fluid pressure in the tumor by this technique called wick and needle approach uh, vehicle and different levels of uh, hyaluronidase. And you see in the tumor, there's a release of pressure, uh, which was previously there prior to the drug treat. And if you see, once the, uh, the hyaluronidase has been used, compared to control, here is a doxorubicin in a liposome, it has accumulated much better than without the uh, hyaluronidase. Same thing with the docetaxel that uh, your tumor volume has gone significantly down when you use PEG PH20 and docetaxel. And also the benefit of combined uh, chemotherapy with PEG PH20, it prolongs the survival. Here is the phase one we study uh, in uh, high hyaluronidase or low hyaluronidase with PEG PH20 that uh, compared to low hyaluronidase deposits, uh, uh, when, when PEG PH20 is used in tumors which uh, uh, have a high hyaluronidase, you have benefit uh, in these pancreatic tumor patients. And uh, so, but again, here there was no imaging uh, used to see which benefits. And I'm sure here any a indirect or direct PO2 imaging could have selected patients who would benefit from this rather than all patients who were accrued in their protocol. So here, what we did is we took, uh, we took uh, uh, animals which are uh, expressing high levels of hyaluronin or low levels of it. When you take uh, this uh, before and after treatment, control and after treatment in uh, tumors which don't express high levels of uh, the stroma, uh, when you take it on the second day, the PO2 histogram shifts to the left. But in tumors which have high extrastromal deposits and we use this PEG PH20, we have uh, shifted the histogram to the right, suggesting we have increased oxygenation. So here also PEG PH20 uh, before and after, you can see significant reoxygenation. This is also uh, corroborated with pemonidazole hist histogram. So using that, uh, while wild type has no benefit with PEG PH20 and ionizing radiation, uh, here in tumors which express high levels of uh, uh, tumor stromal deposits, uh, when we use PEG PH20 and followed by radiation, uh, we have improved the survival. So these two agents which left us at uh, phase three without uh, a solid success, had there been an imaging component to it, uh, it, it they would have succeeded. So again, now I don't want to go through all the pub uh, details of publications we have made use of in EPR, uh, but I'm just giving these because this is being recorded and if people want to go through some of our, uh, for any reason, they want to see what the methods are. Uh, this is one example I'll still dwell on that when we used pyruvate uh, for hyperpolarized MRI, we just were curious what happens to oxygen. And we found that uh, after a bolus pyruvate at a level needed for C13 imaging, you see there was a transient decrease in tumor oxygenation. So while this was quite a thing we were saying what to do and Bob Gillies, who sadly is no more, and I, we were 
in at a meeting in India, and we were having uh, we were at the bar, and then he said, then we said we can make use of uh, this uh, transient hypoxia with a very innocuous agent like pyruvate, and then we used that, and we were able to show that we potentiated the efficacy of this hypoxia activated prodrug. And then single point imaging, this is the reference which uh, my, he was my teacher, my colleague and uh, my advisor, Dr. Subramanian, and uh, he and my engineer, Devasoheim and Murges and, and all my colleagues, we did this uh, with the suggestion from a broker engineer that uh, uh, phase encoding for EPR is better than frequency encoding and uh, we thank Yost for that. And then how we improved upon uh, learning some from the Chicago group for T1 weighting. And uh, then various drug studies and some experiences with orthotopic uh, gliomas. And uh, now the question for all of you uh, and me is what next for EPR studies in humans, whether we have to use CW or pulsed. In my experience, uh, uh, pulsed uh, EPR experiments can be de-skilled that uh, people with very little prior experience, they don't have to do critical coupling and tuning as is needed for CW. So because learning from Dr. Eaton's lab that overcoupled resonators use the B1 better than not. Uh, so we, based on that, we made all our resonators on that basis. and. Uh, most of my colleagues who use this a lot are uh, MDs and surgeons and uh, in a week they're trained so for pulse. So that is why we uh, prefer pulse GPR. What is the optimal frequency for regions of interest, not the whole body? Uh, we should decide, uh, we should uh, think about. And if we say we're going to have a 600 or 700, uh, what is the duty factor of the RF deposition? I think we're all clear that uh, triple radicals for infusional studies and uh, uh, particulates such as uh, oxy chip are good for uh, uh, specific regions and uh, anatomic core registration, whether it's CT or MRI. So I want to show on the left, uh, this is a 0 0.6, 0 0.064 millitesla MRI which is uh, basically a unit developed uh, by a company called Hyperfine, not related to any EPR Hyperfine, but uh, it is a point of care instrument uh, at uh, 64 millitesla. And uh, Yale has done so many clinical studies for brain imaging, for ischemic, uh, uh, any other thing. So this is a platform if we use, and OTM has come similar to that. If we can integrate, something similar, not 64 millitesla, but something similar as a magnet gradient system so that we can do an EPR imaging and transition the, try to transit the uh, speed object to this and get um, anatomic imaging and whatever else uh, this may give us. So with that, I stop uh, my presentation and uh, we will go back to this slide, but I want to thank all my uh, colleagues uh, highlighted here and uh, some of the work uh, about Yoichi uh, Takagusagi had it in the previous file, but uh, uh, he has done a lot of work. And uh, these are my clinical colleagues with whom I'm working uh, for the C13 project, but they have a lot of interest, uh, especially he, Dr. Linhan, whose specialty is the renal cell carcinoma. He is doing a lot of EPR and uh, Kevin Camphausen, uh, who's a radiation oncologist, we do uh, some autotopic brain tumors and uh, friend Pete Choiki and Dr. Citrin and uh, Neckers and the box bomb who, with whom we did some work. Uh, she is now at uh, Roswell Park. Mark Gilbert is a neuro-oncologist. We are doing C13 work and Pinto does prostate surgeries. So we'll do the C13 work and a lot of support uh, I have received from Alan Koritsky and his colleagues. With that, I thank uh, my colleagues and the audience and then go back to here. 
Okay, great, Murali. That's a very, very nice and overview of all the great work you have done in the last 30 plus years or so. And, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Those who want to ask questions, you can unmute your microphone and ask, or you can type and, and then I will read it to Murali for answer. Questions? Well, I'll start us off. This is Marty Pagel. I really enjoyed uh, the presentation. I'm curious, we often talk about how hypoxia is uh, transient and fluctuates within the tumor fluxional. What about interstitial pressure? Uh, do you find that is uh, heterogeneous and uh, fluxional in comparison? That, uh, that's a good question. And uh, I don't have any experimental answer to give, but uh, Dr. Duhers said there's a significant heterogeneity in the tumor uh, interstitial pressure as well. There was one study uh, from Israel which uh, showed that uh, uh, the whole tumor blob doesn't have a single pressure reading. And uh, they used actually MRI for that. I'll dig out that paper and send. They, ba <laughs> they basically did the uh, infusion of gadolinium complex and then they looked at uh, T1 and Sanfment uh, as, a, as a read of how a molecule penetrates through the tumors, uh, through tumors with the high pressure, low pressure, they were able to make some maps of that. Uh, I, I have a question on the same thing, we're talking about fluctuations or oxygen cycling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of confusion when you do EPR oxygen measurement, you know, there could be several factors, including instrumentation, animal breathing, motion, or even some spin dynamics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So your PO2, if you record as a function of time, is not going to be a flat line. It's going to be oscillation, right? And people Depends. call that fluctuation as cycling hypoxia, but cycling is different. There should be a periodicity to the fluctuation, right? I don't, people do not show the periodicity. You know, you're okay, but I'm talking about others. When the other talk about cycling hypoxia, I do not see them showing that there is a cyclicity in the very fluctuation. Bernard Actually, Gallagher. we have seen the cyclicity even in the normal region of the animal. Right, uh, that, and also in tumors, uh, we don't expect any periodicity because of the chaotic architecture. And Bernard Gallus has also shown with T2 star imaging, uh, even before us, uh, it's just that we used EPR, but uh, Bernard Gallus has shown that even before. And uh, that uh, also shows, uh, for example, if you see the slide, the cycling happens uh, in the tumor, which is peripheral. Uh, whereas this, if it, this is four, region four is in the core, that is diffusion limited hypoxia. And uh, uh, then what Mark Duher said about uh, this is that the, what is important is uh, the erythrocyte flux is what determines. Uh, so sometimes there'll be only plasma flow, not erythrocyte flow. So the, <laughs> yeah, these are many multifactorial. There, there is a question from MD Anderson, Dr. Tianche Lee, asks about during EPR experiments, what breathing rate do you keep the mice at? What breathing rate? I have to go back to my paper, but I will respond. I can't pull it out on the top of my head. Uh, uh, so one thing I had to admit is uh, this is a secret among this group. Uh, whenever any animal experiment is done, uh, I can't, I can't be in that room. <laughs> but you don't, you don't control. We control, no, we have a, what do you call, uh, there's a, we have a, a system which uh, keeps, uh, uh, essay instruments. That's the um, uh, instrument uh, we use. And uh, we I had to get uh, back to her or him uh, with, the, uh, with 
details in the paper. I can't uh, recall top of my head. Uh, yeah, Burali, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So basically it's a suggestion or maybe, so I like that uh, you work on this Frank and Hadamard sequences, mm -hmm. uh, which reduces the power absorption. So what do you think limitation of translating this to clinical system? Uh, the, actually, we, the Eatons were the first to show that uh, 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 it can be used uh, using Frank or so limitation is how do you continuously excite and continuously recover the signal. I don't know if the Eatons are on the line, but uh, if uh, you have a circulator for that and depends on the insertion loss of the circulator versus the diplexer, whether it's uh, uh, so that is something we are actively now pursuing because the last two, three years I had a significant uh, reinvestment reinve of my time on uh, getting the clean room ready for C13 operations. Now that it's on track, we're going back uh, with the new system of uh, EPR instrumentation with surface mounted devices. And uh, that will cut down some noise associated with the uh, uh, analog components. But uh, I, Howard and Gareth uh, uh, can also give quality assessment on this. But I think uh, in principle, that should be tried. And, yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll do that. And we just have, uh, I don't still know my... Uh, signal processing colleagues, uh, they have come up with an actively uh, an, an isolate, what do you call, circulator with more active management, not as a passive device. So with that, uh, we plan to uh, retry that experiment to see if we have improved signal noise on that. Yeah, and I just wanted to make another comment that uh, SPI working very well in our hands on Jiva and oh. we, in, especially in in vitro, we can get below 100 micron resolution. Mm. In vivo is still a challenge we have. I see. Maybe we compare the codes, uh, as I said yes. before, we have uh, no inhibition to pass on whatever we learn and do it here. Thank you. Howard, uh, what do you say about Frank and Harman? Over there, he was there. I don't know whether he's still there or muted. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I me on it. behalf of Howard, uh, no. he said that we are really interesting in, in these sequences, but don't have much experience currently with, with, no. with using them because it's look for me that a major limitations of these sequences uh, is a necessity to detect while you excite. And for even quasi pulse experiment, this this is not easy, especially on the animals which have a different coupling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they breathe. But uh, I think that's questions mostly to group of Professor Eaton, who have the largest experience in this. To create a detection window. uh nothing here so maybe one more question morally this is a very general question i know in the last three decades you have worked on multiple translational type of research you know you started with the nitroxide therapeutics which you didn't talk in this one and that was again aimed at uh, in a therapeutic so i think that's in in clinical trial i believe i don't know the update on that. And then the, you worked on EPR, uh, redox imaging, EPR imaging, and then the EPR technology, CW pulse, single point imaging, then OMRI, metabolic imaging, etc. all aimed at translating to clinic, mm -hmm. including the probe, probe development. You worked on particular probes, you worked on the clinical probes. So Going forward from now, what's your goal? If you want to take something to the clinic, do you aim to do that? Or if not, what is your accommodation? I think uh, uh, one easy uh, low hanging fruit is uh, implant the particulate and follow that with a 
surface coil at a region which needs to be followed. That is something which is easy to translate. And for Trittles, uh, Howard and I, we had a long discussion because when we do C13 MRI and we use the Trittles to polarize the C13 nucleus, and then we, before injecting into the patient, we strip the solution of pyruvate uh, from py uh, the trittle radical, not because it's toxic, but the T1 uh, becomes shorter while we run the sample from the polarizer to the patient. So we strip that. But even after stripping, there's still about five micromolar in the injections uh, liquid. So Howard and I, we had uh, 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 considered if we can increase the dose by either local injection of higher level and uh, then use a deuterated trittle and then maybe slightly higher frequency can all these things and use a much better magnet. The magnet we use for EPR actually we bought it in 94 and uh, it, uh, it uh, did work for us well. It's still working, but uh, they're better magnets. Uh, better magnets means better homogeneity. Better homogeneity means uh, longer FID. So, all, so the deuterated molecule, better magnet and uh, local injection, can we come to detection? Because the regulatory burden for OXA 71 is going to be a lot less because people already have received the injection containing trittle. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, just uh, great seeing all the work that the community has been doing and Morali, you've done an amazing job. Uh, great to see you're looking at wireless coils too. Yeah. And uh, great to have it's a huge amount of progress that's been made. So fascinating. So. Yeah, wireless coils, uh, tip of my hat to Joe Murphy for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good friend Joe helped me with that. <laughs> that's good to hear. I'm not surprised. So. <laughs> he also built us the, Joe also built us the best head doublet and proton carbon 13 coil for humans, better than uh, commercial products. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. It's nice to see my old world. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you sometime. So, yeah. So, what right. is G interested in this? Any, Fraser? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, I'm always interested in it, and it's nice to see how far you've taken things. So, yeah, we'd love to have further discussions. Um, yeah. Okay, good. You know, yeah, you're, you're doing, you, you've always been doing the most profound work. You, you can't do this stuff with mainstream MRI. You know, this is you're looking at the fundamentals of right. of, uh, of of the tumors and the response. So it's fascinating. So. Yeah. Hi, I, I've been fr I've been trying to get into the meeting a little bit. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Loud and clear. Yes. You can. You can. Okay. No. No. Lovely. Lovely talk, Merle. I my my system. Uh, uh, my connectivity and and my computer is uh, uh, I've been able to hear, but I haven't been able to speak. It, it's very nice to to hear all that uh, that wonderful progress you guys have made. Um, and uh, yeah, we we just brought up the uh, uh, the Frank sequences uh, this last week, um, but again, as as Boris has mentioned, it it uh, uh, it's got some problems in terms of the variability and the coupling uh, to the animal. I see. All right. But we've got... Yes. All right, if there are no more questions, um, let us thank Murali for, again, for the wonderful presentation and also answering the questions. And uh, before we leave, I uh, want everybody to know that uh, on November 16th, Valerie Kramsoff from West Virginia University will be talking about multifunctional uh, EPR profiling of tumor microenvironment, and that's on November 16th. You check your uh, mailbox, you, you may get a reminder as well. And this is what we had today. And with that, I thank uh, 
uh, for giving me the opportunity to conduct this one and uh, back to Mirinjoini. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. And I hope, uh, thanks Murali for excellent overview of the SPI technique and all the work you have done. And thanks all for joining. And I hope you'll tune in next month again. And happy Diwali again. Happy yep. Diwali.